let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me. You know, that's the world needs. We need reformation in our nation. We need revival in our church. But we need a revolution of the love of God. We need an understanding of the love of God. Because that's, that's, what, we, that's what we see right now. That's because we, we all of the violence, the, the hatred, the, the prejudice and racism that's trying to raise its ugly head in our nation once again, all of this that we see is something that actually Jesus said that we would see in the last days. He gave us signs that would take place. He said, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars, Matthew 24. How many of you know there's rumors of war and, and there, there is war, there's war on terrorism? Because the ultimate terrorist, the number one terrorist, is not somebody from the Middle East, it's Satan himself. Who stirs up the hearts of men and women who are separated uh, uh, from God. Everything that we see in the world, and it's amazing, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, this is 2,000 years ago, he said this. He said, in the last days before I return, he said, nation will rise up against nation. The word nation there is the word in the Greek, it was written in, uh, it is it's the word ethnos, ethnic, ethnos. It means race. He said, in the last days, race will rise up against race. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. The two kingdoms that, that are at odds with one another and at war with one another is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Again, where and why and what is the reason that we see all of these things happening around us in our society, in our culture, in our nation, and, in, and even around the world. It is because man and woman, until they are born again, they are acting out of Adam's rebellion against God. It is a rebellion against God. And when, when, Adam, and Eve, when Adam and Eve fell, it literally took the whole human race into a position and place where we now see ourselves as the only ones that can take care of ourselves. We see ourselves trying to orchestrate our life apart from God because that's what Adam did. The problem is that when God, when, uh, the, the, when the devil tempted Adam and Eve and told them that they would be like God, that they could create, orchestrate life themselves, they found out that after that happened that he lied to them because he is the father of all lies. Everything that he presents to you that seems to be pleasurable and, 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 and seems, it seems to be in a position and a place that uh, you're going to ascend to another level presented by the devil, he does that to, to, to deceive you, to, to make you actually to come into a place of bondage and eventually for destruction. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. And, and, and the key to what happened to Adam and Eve is what you see even from their offspring, Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother, Abel. And it was amazing because all of it has a spiritual origin. It all goes back to two people who were the head of the human race. Whatever they would do because they were in covenant with God and whatever decisions they would make would be passed down to the whole human race. Every single one of them. And what did he pass down to us? He passed down to us the sinful nature, rebellion against God. And anytime you have humanity that is in rebellion against God acting out of that rebellion, it's always going to bring killing, stealing, and destroying. Because that is the platform that the devil operates on. 
Jesus said that in John 10, 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So when Adam and Eve, when they, when, when they rebelled against God and came alongside Satan in his rebellion against God, the whole human race was plunged into rebellion. And every single human being, when they're born into this world, we're born with a, human na- with a, with a sinful nature. That's passed down to every single one of us. And, and so, so when Adam and Eve sinned uh, against God, what did they lose? Because the devil told them they would gain. Every time the devil tells you and presents you something that you think you're going to gain from it, you're eventually going to lose. You'll eventually have destruction. You'll have loss in your life. So Adam, when he was in, Adam and Eve were walking in the presence of God, living with God. And, and, and there they had their identity. They had their purpose. They had peace. They had joy. They had security. But when they sinned against God, the first thing he lost was his identity. They lost their peace. They lost their real joy because joy comes by and through the Spirit of God. Joy does not come by you achieving and accomplishing something or acquiring something. That's not joy, that's a temporary happiness. Because no matter what you get externally, it can never satisfy internally. And you'll get bored with it after a while. I mean, you you think that your car, when you buy it brand new, that is it. I'm going to be the happiest person in the world. Man, it, they, they, I mean, people are going to be, like the, like the uh, uh, advertisements, people are going to be stopping on the street and watching me go by. No. And nobody stopped and looked at your car. And the crazy thing is, is we go out and buy that car to impress people who don't even like us. We're trying to get attention from people who don't even care about us. So so, so the acquisition of things brings a temporary happiness. They lost their joy. Joy is something that is internal and joy can only come by the Spirit of God. Only by the Spirit of God. It comes in no other way. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy. Peace. You can't get peace in any other. No matter what you do, you can't get peace out of a bottle. You can't get it out of a drug. You can get a temporary numbness. But you can't get real peace. You can't have real joy. Everything out here that happens externally and everything that I acquire, again, is a temporary happiness. Happiness and joy are two diametrically opposite things in my life. Because happiness only comes when everything is happening the way I want it to happen. And as long as everything is happening the way I want it to happen, I'm I'm happy. I'm happy. I mean, I'll tell other people, I'll, I'll, I'll sing to them, start whistling that song. Don't worry. Be happy. Because I'm happy. But if everything outside unhappens and doesn't happen the way you want it to happen, and all of a sudden it's out of your control, you are now unhappy. So happiness and unhappiness is like a roller coaster and has everything to do with your emotions. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit, there is no such word as unjoy. There's no unjoy. Joy comes from God. So therefore, because joy is internal and comes from God, no matter what's happening out there, I can still rejoice. And I don't rejoice in what's happening to me. I rejoice in the fact that no matter what's happening to me, God's got a solution. He's got a provision. He's already got it taken care of because God knows the end from the beginning. In other words, whatever has started in my life, God's already been there. 
And now, no wonder he says, walk me through the valley. Because if I look, if I look and I concentrate, I will see that there's footprints already there. Because he knows the end from the beginning. So he already wrote the end. Then he comes back to the beginning and says, come on, son. I've already been there. Come on. Here, here, here we go. So, so, no matter, so no matter what I face or what happens to me, God's already been there. And that's the reason that he's Jehovah Jireh. Which actually means in the Hebrew, it means, uh, 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 we know it means my God shall supply. But the actual Hebrew definition of that is this. Jehovah Jireh means I will see to that. I will see to that. Because anything that happens in your life, when it happens, you don't have to go and pray and in your prayer time tell God all that's happening. He already knows. I used to think that I had to pray and tell God everything that was happening to me to inform him because he's so busy in the Middle East. He has no idea what's happening at 420 Dunn Road in Fedville, North Carolina. So I have to inform him. And not only do I pray to inform him, I also pray and instruct him how he should do it. Nope. Where does God live? Take your finger and go right here. Right here. This is his home. This is his home. Now some of us have a bigger home than others, but... (laughs) That's okay. That's okay. He's still there. Doesn't matter if I'm tall, short. It doesn't matter. He's there. He's there. So, so for me, for me to get to the place that I am rejoicing. Remember, I, I used to not understand this. Count it all joy when you fall into different trials and testings. I mean, I remember saying to the Lord, every time I'd read that, I'd look at the Lord and I said, I'm not there yet. I don't know if I will ever get there. I'm not quite there yet. Count it all joy. The reason you can count it all joy is because God lives in here. And nothing can separate me from the love of God. And every problem, every situation, every event comes. He's right here with me. If he's with me, then the Holy Spirit is here. And the Holy Spirit, I have the the Lord, the Holy Spirit living in me. And he is all wise. You realize that he's smarter than Google. And he lives here. So no matter what happens, he's already got a solution. He's already got a plan. He does not have plan B. He, he does not. When, 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 when something happens to me, it's not me coming to him and letting him know everything that is going on in my life right now and bringing him up to date. It's not me going to him and saying, do you see all this stuff that's going on? Do you see what they did to me? Do you see what's happening? Do you see this situation? Do you see these circumstances? Do you see, God, do you know how this happened? God, do you know what's going on here? It's not like you're telling him that and going, I am so sorry. I have been over here working on this situation over in the Middle East. I mean, these folks are crazy over here. And I'm trying to get everything. I'm trying to get them to get into a place where we can get, you know, we can have some peace over here or do anything. I, I'm sorry. Now, now tell me again. Tell me exactly what's going on here. Tell me exactly what's happening. What, what, what's taking place? No. God knows every, everything that comes to you comes to Him. Comes to Him. When you come to Him, you can come to Him and say, Father, 
okay, I know you know the situation that's going on right now. And I need your wisdom. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your direction. I need your provision. I need your healing. I need, I need to know exactly, according to your word, Father, how do you want us? I don't say, how do you want me? How do you want us to handle this? What do we need to do at this point, at this time? See, I didn't have that before I was saved. Before I was saved, I had to, I, 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 I had to handle everything. Because I was separated from God. Because I was, I was a sinner. I was living in sin. And, and, and sin separates us. And that's what happened to the whole human race. The whole human race is separated from God. And now, not only am I separated from God, but now I'm dealing with, with, with issues. That's the reason I took psychology when I was in college and majored in psychology and worked on my master's and other things in psychology. The only reason I took it is because I wanted to find out why I was crazy. I didn't, I didn't take it intending to help somebody else. I needed a lot of help. And I, I didn't, but, but, but after I got through with all my studies and got, into, got my degrees and got, got psych, psychology and all that stuff, I just found out that what was missing in all of psychology after I got saved was the spiritual aspect. Oh, there's certain, th certain things you can do with the mind, but the key to our, our, our whole life, the key is that when Jesus comes to live on the inside of us, he comes to live right here. This is called the hidden man of the heart in the Bible. He comes to live in here where my spirit man, your spirit man, your spirit, soul, and body, where your spirit man is located right here. He comes to live here. So when he comes to live here, all the love of God, the spirit of God, all is right here inside of me. There is no problem with here. The only problem I have is here and here. If I don't get this in alignment with this, then this and this will keep me in a, in a state of misery and frustration constantly. Because when something happens to you and somebody does something to you, in here where the Spirit of God lives, the Spirit of God will say, forgive them. Your head says, no, I'm going to knock their head off. And the flesh will follow up with that. So I've got to get this into alignment with this. How do I do that? That's the reason that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you are coming to the discipleship classes on Wednesday nights. You're coming because you're going to get this renewed. I can't think like the world thinks. See, the Bible says the, the natural man does not understand the things of the spiritual man. So if I stay carnal and natural up here, I'm not going to understand really how to deal in the spiritual realm where I need to be. Because that's where God operates. That's where he operates. So I've got to get myself in that position and in that place. And there's only one place and the only thing that I can do, which is my responsibility. Because the Bible says in Romans the 12th chapter, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world any longer. Don't look like the world any longer. Don't act like the world any longer. Don't talk like the world any longer. But be transformed. Metamorphosis. Be transformed like a, like, like a caterpillar in a cocoon. Metamorphosis takes place and comes out as a butterfly. See, before I'm saved, I, I'm like that caterpillar in that cocoon in darkness. But the moment I get saved, wow, the light of God, the life of God comes on the inside of me and sets me free from that bondage sets me free from that and then when I start renewing my mind not to be conformed to the way I used to think the way I used to act when I start renewing my mind all of a sudden my mind now is being transformed because my mind now is being transformed by faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and I am living by a whole new currency right now 
And that is the currency I'm living by is faith. And why is that so important? Because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. But it would be an injustice if God did not give me the vehicle and the instrument whereby I can have faith. And I mean much, mucho. You didn't know I could speak Spanish. Mucho faith. Mucho faith. That means that my faith will continue to grow from faith to faith to glory to glory. A lot of people get saved and all they have is salvation faith and they stop there. When I was in the church that I grew up in, all it was was about salvation. I never grew in the things of God and the Word of God. So God had to move me. I thank God for my church where I was at. But that's all they preached. That's all they taught. And I thank God for that because seeds were sown. But God had to take me into another place where the Word of God was actually being taught. Where I would grow and my faith would grow. And, 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 and as that happened, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more word that I heard, my faith was growing. But at the same time, I've got to be able to do, be doing what I'm hearing. Because if I'm not doing what I'm hearing, then my faith is dead. And the reason it's so important for me to be doing because of my faith is this. It's important for the doing because in the doing, people will see me doing what I'm believing. And that means that the people who cannot see God, who cannot understand the Bible, who has no idea what, who Jesus is or what he's done, or they can only see when I become a living epistle. You and I, we are a walking sermon. We are being read. We are a living epistle, the word of God on our minds, in our hearts. My life, your life, is a living epistle, living before men and women so they can see how real God is. And the big test, the big test comes when you get on trial by the devil and when issues and situations come that are beyond you and bigger than you like Goliath when he shows up. But yet at the same time, people are watching Everybody is watching. What are they, they going to do? I know what they're going through. I know what's happening to them. What are they going to do? How are they going to act? When they see, when the world sees us acting like them in a situation like we have no hope and we have no faith, then Jesus is not the answer. But when they see us standing strong, believing God, holding on to the Word, speaking the Word, praising God, when, 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 when I'm in the pit, I'm putting a praise on it. I, I, I'm, I'm putting a praise on it. I'm praising God. I'm worshiping God. And people come up to me and say, I, I have no idea. What are you going to do about this? I've already done something about it. What have you done? I've taken it to God. And here's what the Word of God says. And I'm standing on His Word. And this is what I'm believing. Remember, when you start telling people like that, the Bible says the, the, the natural mind cannot understand the things of the Spirit. So a lot of times they won't understand why you're saying that and putting your trust in God. But the more they look, the more they watch, the more they see, and you're operating in faith, all of a sudden they see something turn around. They see things happening. And the next thing before you know it, when they run into a problem and a situation, guess who they're going to come to? That's the reason that God can take your pain, your grief, your suffering, your issue, and that you want to keep private, He'll put it on a public platform. Because how is anybody going to see Him unless they see you go through? How can you have a testimony without a test? When you were going to school... And you were given a test, and the grades were given out. Everybody was looking and knew what you did. I mean, in my class, she put it on the outside of the classroom on a piece of paper. Had it to the door, and I walked, don't do that. <laughs> I want everybody to see that I didn't study. But see, the only way that people can see, 
the love of God, the power of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, is when they see you handling your issue based upon God's love, His kindness, His grace, His mercy, and His word. And, if, and, and if, I, if I base it on his word, then I'm going to see his power. And they're going to see his power. They're going to see me come through this, come hell or high water. I'm trusting God. God, I'm trusting you. God, you put me on this platform. You put me, everybody knows what's going on. I'm trusting you. I'm, my whole trust is in you 100%. I'm trusting you. And I'm not going to back off letting everybody know you're going to handle this. You're going to take care of this. I don't know how you're going to do it. And I don't even know when you're going to do it. But I'm not coming off my platform. I'm not coming off the rock. I'm not coming off the word. I'm not coming off what I'm believing. I'm not coming off of what I, I, what, what I see or what I believe. I'm just choosing that I will call those things which be not as though they were. So you got, you have this whole world. The whole world is acting with a sense of guilt, shame, inferiority, insecurity, unworthiness, wanting to be accepted and wanting to be loved unconditionally. And the only way that they can see that you have been set free from that is by your behavior and conduct. And the way you handle things. If I don't renew my mind, I can still be born again here, but I can still be in bondage to insecurity, inferiority, fear, and intimidation. Because everything that you need when you got saved came to you all at one time. Nothing was left out. God has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything. He didn't leave one thing out. And when he did, he didn't say something like, okay, this is going to be a sequel to be continued. And it's a mystery. It is not a mystery. He's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You have to partake of it. And you get everything that he has, not by what you can perform before God, not what you can earn before God, not, not what you can do to try to get God's favor in your life. You got all of that when you got born again. You got every bit of it. It's called grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. And, and, and when you got all of this, when you got everything that God had in the covenant, He gave that to you, all you can do is say, thank you. Because the great thing about grace, the great thing about grace is that He gives me everything and graces me with what I have not earned and what I did not deserve. And in His mercy, He gives me everything that I... That, that I did deserve, but he doesn't give it to me. That's mercy. That's his mercy. That's his grace, his love. And we have this crazy concept about God because of religion. Because, because religion is always trying to appease God. Trying to do something, bring sacrifices and other things. It, it goes back to Greek mythology when everybody was trying to please the gods. And they would get sacrifices and all kinds of things because the gods were so fickle. And the gods could change on a dime and you didn't know what the gods were going to do. So you're constantly trying to bring all kinds of different sacrifices and you had no idea what sacrifice would work. But you're trying to bring every kind of sacrifice in the world. Even in the Old Testament, man, they were so goofed up, they were offering their children on the sacrifice to idols. Trying to hope, hope, hope the gods would show favor on them. So everything they were doing, they were doing it externally, trying to appease and trying to receive the favor and trying to be liked because they knew that the gods were so messed up they didn't love anybody. Except for themselves. And we were just little peons. That's what 
mythology is like. But it's not only that. It's what religion is like. Religion will show you how God is a mean, austere God. And he's always out to get you. See, that's what came when Adam fell in the garden. They were fearful. They were, they were inferior. They, they, they were trying to hide. That's not the way God created them. And that's not what God gives us when we get born again. Can you imagine? Think about this. What is the first thing that Adam saw when he came to life? Watch this. Because the Bible says God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. Sculptured him. He was the pinnacle of creation. The pinnacle. That's the reason we came from a man and a woman. Because every seed produces after its own kind. Right? That's the reason I love Ancestry.com. Because if you go back far enough... You're going to come to one man and one woman. One man and one woman. Never, ever, even though some of us act like this at times, you'll never go back and find a gorilla in your ancestry. Never, never. You're not going to find a salamander. You're always going to come back and you're going to find a man and a woman. That's what you're going to find. Because a human seed will bring forth a human. There has never, ever, ever, ever in the jungles has anybody gone up and found a female gorilla giving birth and all of a sudden out popped a human. It's never happened. It takes more faith to believe that stuff And to believe and look in how intricately that we are made and understand that there was a system and a design that God put together. God created us. God didn't need us. But He is love and love has to give. He created us so He could lavish Himself and who He is Because he is love. He's not becoming love. He doesn't have degrees of love. Percentages of love. He is love. And he created us to lavish all of this on us. But he created us in a way that we, he had to give us freedom of choice. Even it means freedom of choice to disobey him and walk away from him. Because he didn't want a robot. He wanted us to freely love him. And what I love is that when he was when, when he was forming man of the dust of the ground and he got everything that, that, was, that was right there. I mean, I can see God, okay? I can see him doing this like, like a sculptor is sculpturing. And he's he just, man, he's so excited. So excited. Because this, this is the pinnacle of creation. There is no purpose for the earth without a human being. No purpose. Don't give me this mother nature stuff. There's no purpose for the earth apart from the human beings that God intended to be on this earth. So God is creating man. He creates him. And then the Bible says he did this. He blew the breath of life. First thing happened to man was God kissed him. He got right down, he got right down in his face and he went. And the Bible says that life came into him. Bam! Man is created. Man is there. And what's the first thing he sees? What's the listen? Listen, I was I was with my wife when four children were born. And it was the craziest thing in the world because she's going through all this pain. She, 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 all this stuff that she's going through, okay? It's the most helpless feeling for a man in the world. All you can do is stand there and go. 
Breathe. 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 That's just stupid. <laughs> and she's going there, to, you know, like that. Most amazing thing in the world. When our babies came out and that umbilical cord was cut and they took that baby and laid that baby right there. I, it, it's like everything that just happened just disappeared. And she looked at every one of our babies. The biggest smile came across her face. And she looked, she looked at me and we're just standing there smiling. And she said, oh gosh, just like that. And I remember the first time that our baby was born. And I sat there and I looked at her smile. And I looked at her holding that baby right there on her chest. And I, I thought to myself, that's exactly what happens when we get born again. That's exactly what happens when we get born again. God sitting right there just with the biggest smile. And Adam being created with the biggest smile. Can you imagine this? Created in the smile of God. Through the love of God. Oh, man. If I start crying, I don't apologize for it. Because it is beyond me. It is beyond how I can be the biggest sinner in the world. I can be the most ungodly, wickedest person in the world. And God says, I love you. That's not, who you're, that's not who I created you to be, son. That's not who I created you to be, daughter. I didn't create you to go out there and just give yourself away to everybody as if you, you, you're looking for acceptance and you're looking to be needed from everybody and you're letting people come sweet, whisper sweet nothings in your ear. It's all deception. It's all a fake just so they can satisfy their own lust and whatever they, they, they want. And that's not the way God is. That's the way the world is. God comes in and he says, I love you. And to show you that you can live the way I created you to live. And so that you can have joy and peace and kindness and goodness and all of these things. And you have security and provision. He said, I'm going to come live inside of you. You're going to be my home. You're going to be my display to the whole world. Of who I am. I am going to present you to this world. To let them see my goodness. My kindness. My forgiveness. My love. My joy. And, and by the way. All the days of your life were written before you ever lived one of them. you got a purpose. you got a destiny. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. I've got, I've got a purpose and a destiny for your life. And, and, and that, 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 that goes as we go in seasons, as, as God leads us, guides us, and directs us in whatever vocation. Whatever you do is not who you are. Because if who, what you do is who you are, when you retire, you're going to die because you have no purpose and no value to live on. So who, what you do is not who you are. What you do is you do it because you're a representative of the kingdom of God. And wherever you go and whatever vocation it is, the most important thing is that you understand that your identity is in Christ Jesus and you're there for a purpose and you're there for a reason. And you, you get paid for it and you have a job, but you're there for a purpose and a reason. You're there to be light in the middle of darkness. You're there to present to everybody you work with the glory and the love and the, and, and the magnificence of God. That's the reason it's so important for us to live the way we're supposed to live. Because people are always watching you. They're always seeing. Not that we don't make mistakes. We're, not, we're, we're, we're perfect because a lot of times this overtakes this. Thank God for repentance. Thank God that when this and this gets out of whack... And I do something, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is there. And then I say, Father, forgive me. I shouldn't have talked like that, acted like that. Forgive me. And the thing with God, everything that you have from God, you cannot earn it. 
all you do is thank him. You know what faith is like? Where's Pastor Thomas? Pastor Thomas, come here. Pastor Thomas, get your best guitar, the one you just love above all others. Well, I, I want you to pick the one that you play the most, that you just you love to play more than anything else, the one that has more value to it. Okay. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give me your guitar. Now, wait a minute before you do it. Have I done anything to earn you giving me that guitar? <laughs> Nothing. I haven't performed. I haven't achieved. I haven't accomplished. I haven't done anything. You're going to give me that guitar because of who you are and because of your love and your love that you have for me. You're going to give me that guitar. And you're, go you're actually going to be excited about giving it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and for the joy that was set before you uh, of getting that guitar to give it to me, the joy that is there, you could not wait until you found me and you were going to give me that guitar. Right? Yes. So I didn't earn it. Nope. Didn't do anything. Nope. When, you have, when, you, when you have a little teeny baby, that baby burps, cries, poops, does all kinds of things. Hasn't done anything to be a part of the family other than just being there. Hasn't earned anything, hasn't done any chores whatsoever. That baby is just there. But you let that baby make one little sound during the night. And I'm telling you, mama, daddy, or mama, or daddy, they're there. Baby hadn't earned anything. Done nothing to achieve it. And you go there, not because of what that baby has done. You go there because of who that baby is. And that baby belongs to you. And you will die for that baby. You will fight over that baby. You don't mess with my baby. So when Pastor Thomas is going to give me this guitar, which I have not earned, I have not, I have not done anything to get his favor or anything. He's just going to give it to me, and it's his joy to give it to me. Here's what faith is. Faith is this. All I can do is reach out with my hand and receive it. My hand is faith. My faith reaches out and receives what God gives to me. Because it's His free gift. You didn't earn it. All I can do is say, thank you. Thank you for this. And I don't take this and go on and say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you happy you did this. I mean, I, I, I'm now, I, I will perform for you. I'm all, I'm all, now watch this, watch this. Okay. Do you still love me? Did, 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 I, do, do, did I do enough there that you still love me? No matter what you do. So, you love me, I don't have to keep earning this. Not at all. It's mine. That's right. You gave it all to me. I gave it to you. Now I just need to learn how to play it. Walk in it. Learn how it. Learn to do it. And then as I do, 
what you instruct me because you're the master musician. And if I do what you instruct me to do and I'm obedient to you, then this is the sound that will come out of what you gave me if that means you start playing right now. Because if I do what's obedient and I do it because of your love, now, now it makes perfect sense. Now it is doing what it was created to do because now it's in the musician's hands and now you're playing it and I am now that instrument and God now through his love is now, I'm growing I'm learning, I'm taking lessons, I'm renewing my mind and now before long I will become that instrument that makes a beautiful noise that will bless other people Praise God for His love, His mercy, and His grace. Quit trying to perform to earn something that you can't earn, that you have. Now just live out of His love. Walk out of His love. <laughs>